Maninahu, Maniluhu, and again to all dignitaries, and especially again to our uh, wartime survivors. I want to thank you also for, uh, for being here, and thank you for giving me this opportunity uh, to speak, at least in the, in the um, opening. I want to thank Johnny Sablon and his team at Department of Chamorro Affairs, and Senator Antonio Palomo, Guam Museum Chamorro Education Facility, uh, for putting uh, this amazing exhibit together, and which will be coming in the advent of our Liberation Day festivities. Perhaps the timing is even more significant because our war survivors are being recognized this year in a way that they've never been recognized. You know, my parents uh, are among those who are owed war reparations. And for me, this is a little bit bittersweet because there's finally an acknowledgement uh, of their situation and what happened to our people uh, in this very terrible war. But we're also paying for it. Our own people are paying for the hardships of a war which we were innocent bystanders. But let, I'm digressing here. I'm, I'm so fitting that we hold this exhibit named in Hahasuha. We still remember. Here in these halls, named after former senator, uh, an author, an educator, an historian who worked so hard to ensure the stories of the war survivors are always remembered and always passed down to that next generation of Chamorros. He's among those we honor. And I believe his book, Island in Agony, I'm talking about Tony Palomo, uh, it's here in this museum. And he was 10 years old uh, when the Imperial military forces of Japan attacked our island. And his book recounts the story and experiences of Chamorros during the, the Guam occupation uh, of World War II. Uh, similarly, the exhibit looks at the experiences of war and liberation through photos, commemorations, memorials, oral histories, and music. It's very important that these memories are shared. Our Manamku built a legacy of strength, honor, and of courage in the face of danger. It fills me with pride to know that I'm, that I'm one of them. I'm, I'm one of that ilk, those descendants of those uh, that were so courageous. We, the Chamorro people of this generation, must walk with pride, knowing that we are the same blood of that, gen that greatest generation, the people who lived through the greatest tragedy that this island has seen. It has been my own experience that the war survivors do not, they don't really like to easily share their memories. And I know because my parents were sometimes having a hard time sharing their stories with me and the hardships they had lived through. Um, Grandma Veronica, uh, my, my, uh, my grandma, I used to spend a lot of time staying, li uh, sleeping over at her house like all the grandchildren, but she would tell us everything, tell us all kinds of stories of pre-war Guam, and of course her beloved uh, Eduardo, my grandfather who died so young, and about my father and, uh, and, and his brothers. But unfortunately, grandma, you know, she never talked about the war. And I understand because well, she was a, a woman in her mid-30s and knew full well uh, what uh, that war experience was. And uh, for her at the time, I, she was never ready to speak about it. My parents, they were youngsters during the war, uh, 10 years old with the liberation. Um, I, I, I was blessed. I, I just got back a couple of weeks ago and uh, did some work. but. I had an opportunity to spend a week with my mom and dad. There, we got th I got three sisters that are living in the States. And summertime, my mom and dad will go over there, spend some time uh, with the other family members and, their, and the other grandchildren that are out there in the States. So I had an opportunity to spend a week with my mom and dad. It's been years since I've just been with them and having breakfast and, and listening to, sto to, to things, just get, catching up on things. I'm blessed that they're still alive. Uh, I was at the, the War Survivors concert the other night. I don't know if any one of you were there, but that song, uh, Uncle Sam, Sam, oh please, Uncle Sam, won't you please come back to home, to Guam. Uh, it reminds me of just being with my parents a few weeks ago. Because for whatever reason, my dad in the morning, we're having a cup of coffee, and he starts reminiscing. That's the first thing. He sings that song. He, sings, he almost sang it every morning. Uncle Sam, Sam, no oh please, Uncle Sam, won't you please come back to home, uh, to Guam. And I don't know if every family had a different rendition of it. 
because my, my, my mom would get a little angry because he's, there's a part of the song, say, and I don't even know if those were the right words. He says, La La Lucy, it was December 8th, and in Chamorro, La La Lucy, Tal Luis Bassa. And I guess he owned a store there, so he was angry. And then, of course, he goes on the song, and my mom would say, hey, stop talking about my grandpa. And, and I, I don't know, those are the real words for the song, but I, I, maybe everyone had their own interpretation of the song and, and made it up. But so I would uh, listen to their stories. And um, I, I tell you, that war, it, um, I asked my dad this last trip, I said, Pop, what are your fondest memories? What, my dad's best memories and what he felt was paradise was Guam pre-war. It was living in Hagatnya and uh, the experiences of his brother and his cousins in, uh, man, where's that, pro uh, the barrio next to where the police department is. Maybe some of you folks will know there's, there's not Togay, there's San Antonio. Um, is it Santa Cruz? But in those days, it's growing up in pre-war Guam with your friends and your family in that area. And then my mother lived in San Antonio, which is near where the Bank of Guam is now. And man, if you're a boy going to San Antonio, you better be careful. Because it depends on what part or what barrier you are from, from again, yeah? Uh, but uh, so if you, if you know someone in San Antonio and is a pretty girl, better watch out because the boys from San Antonio are, are going to get mad at you. But they did share a little bit. Uh, aside from saying how beautiful Guam was before the war, it was those little things they talked about during the war. Um, my father, the walk from Tizan to Manengun and then across over the mountains to Pigu. Then of course my mother from Jigu down to Menengun, to then across to Pigu. Maybe that's why my mom never gained over 100 pounds. That was a lot of walking. Um, but it's what they saw, how they experienced. Um, everyone lost someone close to them. Death in that, in that march and in that uh, encampment and then the march to Pigu, someone close passes on. And... Uh, Death. For, you know, for I look at 10 year old kids and I look at my ch grandchildren now and, and my kids, I've seen death all around you. Um, it was an amazing experience, um, but that experience from my parents, it's, that experience from you and Manamku and what you went through, really, if you take a look at our beautiful island right now, it's you survivors, you enduring and you helping to build the post-war Guam and the legacy of what we see confront us today in the 21st century. So for us young folks, there may be similar stories that your grandparents and great-grandparents have, and think just how lucky you are to be descendants of such a great people. They lived through a nightmare that not many human beings have seen, and they overcame their struggle in a way most could not imagine. And always be mindful of this fact that there is a blood that runs through our veins from that greatest generation. Always remember that. Always be proud. Always be grateful for their sacrifice and the service of our liberators. And always thank God for the glory of Guam. From their generation to ours and from our generation to yours. God bless you and enjoy this exhibit this Liberation Day. Thank you. Uh, for having me today. Uh, actually, I want to dedicate this presentation to uh, the two women I'm named after. So Victoria was my grandmother's sister who died in the war. She was four. And Lola is my dad's mom, my grandma Lola, and she's also a war survivor. Um, and I think a lot of my namesake is what's motivated my purpose in helping to tell these stories and to um, really remind our community of um, what this war has meant uh, for our survivors, but what it continues to mean for us today. Um, when I originally um, prepared this presentation, um, a war survivor that I had interviewed um, had just passed a week before I had originally, I'd, I'd done this presentation for a teach-in.
Um, this is Tendera, uh, Magdalena Santos to Nicholas Bayani. And uh, she had given testimony uh, before the Guam War Claims Review Commission. And when the Guam War Survivors Memorial Foundation, Foundation had wanted to do um, an insert in the Marianas variety, um, I had gone and, and interviewed some of the survivors that provided testimony to get more details on their story. And so I had the honest privilege of meeting and interviewing Tandetta. And I wanted to share a couple quotes just to think about, you know, war isn't only about sort of the physical suffering um, and, and the physical damage that happens to properties, but it really does affect us as whole beings. So she said, work, that's all we do every day, digging, collecting rocks and trashes, and oh, the sun was so hot. From morning to night, we didn't eat, but we are not hungry. If you are afraid, you don't feel hungry. I was supposed to marry before the war. After the war, my boyfriend came to look for me and I told him I was sorry. I forgot how to love you. Who's gonna think to love when you're suffering? And so I, those quotes always really kind of stuck with me because even on this very human level, the way that we experience love, the way we experience hunger, everything changes when you're living a life in fear. And a lot of survivors, um, their daily experience wasn't, you know, the same, the tragedies weren't happening every day. A lot of them happened towards the end of the war with the massacres or in distinct instances. But for most people, fear and hunger were the feelings that, they, that dominated their life. Um, so just to get a, a glimpse at what the times were like. So the photo on the top is before the war where everybody and see how bustling and, and beautiful Hagatnya is and everybody is walking around. And then immediately after the war, sort of how people really, the, the entire island was bombed and destroyed and people were really just trying to pick their lives back up, right? And so when we think about war reparations um, and why this has taken so long, a lot of it is that initially there were war claims offered at this time, but this is the conditions of what things were like. Um, and also a lot of people left. They joined the military and they left island, right? And so a lot of our war survivors were no longer here either. Um, so those are just some things I wanted to share before I go into the history. Um, so as I mentioned, in, immediately after the war, um, the Guam Meritorious Claims Act of 1945 was passed. And this was really intended um, to give claims to those who had suffered property damage. There was a $5,000 cap per property claim. And if people felt they deserved more, they would have to appeal to the Secretary of the Navy in Washington, D.C. Death and injury claims also had to be approved in, D in Washington. The period for filing claims uh, began after May 6, 1946. Um, the day the Navy regulation was promulgated and ended on December 1st, 1946. So even though the legislation had said it would take a year, the actual period uh, only lasted six months. Um, and in an interview that I had actually with Speaker Cruz, um, after having heard a lot of the testimonies, he said um, people all over the island were in makeshift places. People were out there just trying to get by day by day. They were not out there looking to see if there was anything posted about war claims. He also explained that, you know, because it wasn't like now where, where you have mass media, you have social media, you have many different modes of communication. Back then, none of that was in existence. And, and so the word didn't spread. The word only really spread amongst um, those that were educated in the community or business people. And as a result, all of the claims were for property damage and they were not for injury or death as they should have been. Um, but despite this reality for Guam, um, the United States had thought that the case was closed. They had thought that the Guam Meritorious War Claims Act had resolved um, the, the grievances. And so um, they basically never included Guam in any war claims moving forward. Um, in 1947, there was a commission that was uh, appointed to investigate sort of the handling of Guam's reconstru reconstruction and rehabilitation. And coming out of this commission was what was called the Hopkins Report, um, because it was uh, written by Dr. Ernest M. Hopkins, um, who had chaired the committee. And they had actually said that the Navy's process for settlement and payment of these claims was too slow. 
After the Hopkins Report um, in 1951 in the peace treaty with Japan, the United States actually agreed to pay for all wartime claims made by US citizens and nationals against Japan. So regularly when people talk about war reparations, it's one of their first questions. Why should the US have to pay reparations? Well, prior to the war, the US had frozen the Japanese um, assets. And all those frozen assets after the war were designated to be used to play, pay any claims by US citizens and nationals against Japan for any atrocities they suffered. So, so somebody that was a prisoner of war in Japan, if they were a US citizen or a US national, the US would give them their claim. Um, and so this was very common at the time. This is also what Germany did. So it's not far-fetched to go to your own country to seek claim for suffering during war. However, because they had thought that these um, grievances were handled with the Guam Meritorious Claims Act, when the U.S. did pass a General War Claims Act for all its citizens that had ever experienced any kind of suffering by foreign enemies, Guam was the only place that wasn't included. And the irony is that if you were from Guam and you had been in the Philippines and suffered from uh, the war in the Philippines, you were able to get a claim. But if you were Guam and in Guam and had suffered in Guam, you could not file a claim. And so uh, on the national level, Guam at that time, this is in the 60s, had no representation nationally. So there was no one in Congress saying, wait a minute, no, Guam was not actually fairly compensated and we do deserve claims. And so as a result, it was just kind of left at the wayside. Whereas locally, there were, there were activities happening here. So um, one of the champions sort of of collecting war stories is uh, former Senator Cecilia Bamba, who is an amazing woman on so many levels, but she really organized the community around this. Um, she established the War Reparations Commission locally and dedicated so much of her life to collecting testimonies from hundreds of people, not just here, but also living in the US. So as I had mentioned, a lot of people joined the military and left. And so Senator Bamba went and, and sat with them for hours, collected their story, documented their stories, and also gathered all the names of who, who was alive and who died during the war. And so as a result of her efforts, that's where we have all the names that are on the wall at Nimitz and um, how we, we were been able to collect most of the names of people who were alive and suffered during the war. And so she actually is also the first Chamorro woman to testify before Congress, and she had gone to Congress to testify about the need for reparations. Um, and so out of her efforts, her son, uh, former Senator George Bamba, and former Senator Marilyn Manabusen compiled what was called the Bamba Report. And, and in this report, they also detail all of the different sufferings that had occurred. Um, and they talk about the different sort of local legislative efforts that happened. So in 1967 and in 1972, the local legislature had tried to, they had passed resolu resolutions requesting that Japan pay the reparations. But as I mentioned, due to the treaty, those never went anywhere. Um, and then eventually Guam does get representation, non-voting representation in Congress. And so our first congressional representative, um, Antonio Wanpat, he, he realized in the 80s that there could be a chance for Guam to really try to get reparations and succeed. He had always taken on the issue and been vocal about the issue. But in the 80s when um, Congress was awarding reparations to Japanese Americans who had been interred during the war. And remember, they'd given Japanese Americans $22,000 if they had been interred during the war. Um, he felt this is a great time for Guam to seek reparations. And so he introduced um, legislation in 1983, H.R. 3954, in the 98th Congress, which proposed the establishment of a commission to review the facts and circumstances surrounding the losses caused during the occupation. Um, however, because for decades after the war, Congress had no voice from Guam, it was very difficult for him to convince Congress members that this mattered or that this was deserving of their attention. And so, um, unfortunately, his legislation didn't go anywhere and it failed. Um, after that, um, Guam delegate Ben Blas um, who honestly came the closest to, to getting reparations, 
Um, he introduced three unsuccessful bills in 85, 86, and 87. And then in 1989, um, he introduced H.R. 2024. And so H.R. 2024, I'll just read you the language of that, was introduced in the 101st Congress, which sought to amend the Organic Act of Guam to provide compensation to any eligible person who received a compensable injury, death, personal injury, or forced labor as a result of World War II. It also sought to establish a Guam claims fund in the amount of $20 million from which eligible claimants could receive $20,000 for death, $5,000 for personal injury, and $3,000 for forced labor, forced march, or internment. And so um, it got very far, but there was a catch. Senators Dan and Nui from Hawaii said that if he were to find the money for Blas's legislation, he would need approval from Guam's legislature on this legislation. And according to Dr. Underwood, who I had interviewed about this, this was a very painful thing for uh, Congressman Blas to talk about because he had gone to each senator locally and they all said, yes, okay, uh, we'll support you. Um, but once it went public, they said the money wasn't enough. And so, um, Senator Inouye decided that without the support of local leaders, they could not appropriate the funds. So what had happened is the Guam legislature had passed a resolution actually asking to increase the amounts that were in the, the bill in Congress. And they had specified new amounts. And because they had done that, it, it failed and it didn't go anywhere. And so then in comes uh, Dr. Underwood. And so he as well goes in and, and tries it a few times at trying to reintroduce the same legislation that Congressman Blas had, had introduced. But um, so in his five terms, he introduced five pieces of legislation. The first three sought compensation for those who were killed or suffered during the war. But he also tried to get around one of the biggest obstacles, which is that Congress was unwilling to, and as we know to this day, has, has always been unwilling to provide reparations for the descendants of those who suffered in the war but had since died. So his idea was why don't we create some kind of trust fund that uh, basically descendants of war survivors could apply for scholarships to go to the university or could apply for small business loans to start businesses. Um, and if you establish a trust fund, his intention was, well, then maybe we could actually get Japan to contribute to the trust fund. Because the problem with Japan is that the government never publicly acknowledges the atrocities that have happened here. Um, and so, but if through some kind of nonprofit associated with the government, we could appeal to Japan and say, would you contribute to this trust fund that goes towards education? Then likely that could be a way to also get money from Japan. Um, well, that failed. So Underwood turned to his colleagues in Congress, and he had really long conversations with Senator Inouye and Representative Norman Mineta from California because they had been successful in attaining reparations for the Japanese American internees. So Mineta, who had been interned during the war, said that for a long time it was just simply difficult to get Congress to understand the issue. Thus, they set up a commission to validate their claims. Underwood, realizing that Guam would need to do the same thing, introduced two bills that would establish a Guam War Claims Review Commission. And finally, at the end of his last term in Congress, the second bill passed and became law at the end of 2002. When his successor, Congresswoman Madeline Berdalio, came into office, she was able to secure the funding from the Department of Interior and they created the commission. Uh, the commission was created of, or was made up of uh, three federal officials and two local leaders, and I'll tell you a little bit about them. Um, the chairman was Mauricio Tamargo, an attorney who was then the chairman of the Foreign Claims Settlement Commission. The vice cha chairman was Defunto Antonio Ampinco, the former speaker of the Guam legislature. Robert Lago Marcino, a congressman from California. Speaker B.J. Cruz, and Ruth Van Cleve, who had worked for 37 years in the Department of Interior and had even once served as the Acting Assistant Secretary of the Interior for Territorial and Insular Affairs, meaning she had a lot of experience working with Guam. And so um, the commission was created, and uh, they, they met at the end of 2002 on December 8th and 9th, and they heard from 104 speakers, most of whom were survivors, who had recounted the horrors they experienced during the war. 
Um, the survivors were each asked if they had filed a claim after the war, and most of them had said that they did not file and that they didn't know that they could. Uh, based on these hearings and their extensive research, the Commission unanimously concluded that the people of Guam had not been justly compensated and confirmed the United States' moral obligation to pay reparations for war damages. Congresswoman Berdalio then had the validation she needed to reintroduce the legislation and seek compensation. So she, she did that, and so she began introducing legislation which was first H.R. 1595, and it continued to fail. Um, and, it, it per, and, then, and then introduced H.R. 44. Um, and so let me tell you the difference between the two. Um, so H.R. 1595 uh, basically was called the Guam World War II Loyalty Recognition Act, and it sought claims in the amounts that had been recommended by the commission. And so those amounts were 25,000 for death, which would be paid to the descendants of those who were killed in the war, 15,000 for victims who were raped or suffered personal injury, 12,000 or 10,000, depending on the injury, for personal injury, and then 7,000 for forced labor, um, or no, 7,000 for the, the descendants of deceased survivors. That was the biggest obstacle that Congresswoman Berdalio faced, is that Congress was unwilling, and particularly two senators, John McCain and Carl Levin, refused to support the measure. Um, because they had never done so before. They had never awarded claims to the heirs of those who were aggrieved or who had the grievance. And they felt that this would create a, pres a precedence that could obligate the U.S. to compensate the descendants of people who had suffered other injustices, for example, slavery. If you set the precedent that uh, descendants of those who suffered could file a claim against the U.S. federal government, then the descendants of those who suffered from slavery could file a claim and the U.S. could go bankrupt. Um, and so the War Claims Review Commission had actually foreseen this dilemma and as part of their recommendations, they had said, since Congressman Ben Blas had come the closest to achieving war reparations in 1990, why not award reparations to the descendants of those who had been alive in 1990 and would have already received uh, reparations if they were alive and that legislation had passed? Um, and, and, but still, this was not something that had been introduced and it was not something that they could accept. Um, at one point, uh, M McCain and Levin had said, we'll, we'll pass reparations if you take the descendants out. And they gave Congresswoman Berdalio 30 minutes to make a decision, and she turned it down, saying it wouldn't be fair to the people of Guam if I didn't come back and uh, get their feelings on this. She wanted to hear from us. Would that be OK to accept this without the descendants? She said, I've done everything I can, and so have all my predecessors. I am a persistent person, and I just keep pushing at it all the time, and I will continue to do that, and hopefully we will be successful. And so that's essentially what she did. She pushed forward with H.R. 44, and in, in, the, in, in the case of H.R. 44, eventually the descendants get removed from the legislation. Um, and also, um, something really interesting happened that had not happened before. Um, it was introduced with a funding source. Um, and this is one of the contentious issues about H.R. 44, is that this, the funding source that passed was the use of Section 30 funds. Um, and originally, and still to this day, Congresswoman uh, Berdalio's office is seeking an, another funding source to pay the claims. Um, and, and they had described it as, as a placeholder. Um, and so she, her, her communications director, Adam Carbolito, had explained, we had hoped that it would be President Barack Obama that uh, would pass war claims during his term. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, but that didn't happen, and so they were going to work with uh, Governor Eddie Bozicalvo, who had helped with the Trump campaign, to see if Trump would find another appropriation in his budget for the claims. Unfortunately, that did not happen in this year's budget, and so currently, the funding source for war reparations is Section 30 funds. Well, what are Section 30 funds? Um, Section 30 revenue is revenue that includes federal income tax withholdings from uniformed and non-uniformed employees of the federal government and retirees of the federal government who live on Guam, as well as military service members with Guam 
listed as their state of local residence. So what do we use this money for? Um, this is money that is paid to the government of Guam, um, largely for hosting the military here. Um, and we use it as part of our, our revenue source. So it plays for government operations, including public health, public safety, and public education. Um, and so in talking with a former congressman about this, um, I, I interviewed Dr. Underwood, and, and he had said um, that since the 90s in Congress, um, it's, it's sort of been a pay-as-you-go system. So he says you cannot suggest new funding for anything unless you pay for it or create an offset. And so when he had introduced legislation for war reparations, he had hoped that the funding source would be the Foreign Claims Act, right? Because the Foreign Claims has um, a budget that pays out any foreign claims, right? But that's not the funding source that con Congress would approve. And so Congresswoman Berdalio's office had to find something to offset that cost. And what they had proposed was Section 30 funds. And so because Guam had received um, an excess amount of Section 30 funds in 2014 due to an increase in military presence on the island, the legislation actually says that um, the reparations will be paid uh, in excess of anything over what was earned in 2014 would be set aside and put into the foreign claims fund to pay for the reparations. And so I just put a, a listing of how much was uh, anticipated in the Appropriations Act for 2014 and then for the last three years to kind of get a sense of how much more we have been earning in Section 30 funds since 2014. Um, and so Underwood was really trying to help me understand that um, the way that Congress works today, you have to tease out all of these issues that, especially for Guam, with no voting representation in Congress, it's been incredibly difficult to make our case for reparations, despite the obvious injustice that our people suffered. But even more so, to actually get the federal government to pay for it. And so that's the, the idea behind the use of Section 30 funds, was that this is at least a way to offset the cost while we find another appropriation. Um, and so, as a result, it passed. And in passing, uh, the following um, people qualified to be able to file a claim. And so, uh, people who uh, suffered from rape or any severe personal injury, loss of limb, dismemberment, or paralysis can file a claim in the amount of $15,000. Those who experience forced labor or personal injury, including disfigurement, scarring, or burns, can file a claim in the amount of $12,000. Those who experience forced march, internment, or hiding to evade internment can file a claim in the amount of $10,000. And then those who died in the war are the only ones whose descendants can actually file a claim for their death, but those descendants have to either be the parents of the person who died their widow or their surviving children. Um, no grandchildren can file claims, and those claims are in the amount of $25,000. Um, and then all, all claims, so the way the legislation was written, the Foreign Claims Settlement Commission, uh, which was established to handle all claims uh, of US citizens and nationals for having suffered um, during uh, wartime, they will receive 5% of the money set aside for war claims to file these claims. And all claims must be filed by June 20, 2018. So they released their procedures, they sought comment on it, and then they officially announced that people could begin filing claims on June 20, 2017, so just last week. And we have one year to file these claims. And so you may access the filing, the form to file claims on their website, which I've listed. And then this is also their phone number and the email to um, ask questions if you have any. Um, but I wanted to put that out there because I've been, I've been asked repeatedly over the last two weeks, how do I file claims? How do I file claims? And I have heard that um, the Congresswoman's office is filing claims, that Speaker, Vice Speaker uh, Terlahi is filing claims. Um, but I will say that one of the things to know about the claims process is you must type into the form uh, your claim and you actually must tell your story. So for each one you have to describe what happened to you um, and then it must be notarized and mailed in. 
Also, there is one stipulation, the descendants of those who have died since December 23rd, 2016, when the legislation was passed, can file claims for their deceased uh, survivor only if they had died after December 23rd, 2016. So I wanted to also put that out there. Um, and so this is the history of war reparations. Um, I, I really wanted to go through all of these measures that have, that have taken place because this is a very complicated and painful history, not just for those who suffered through the war or those who have parents that suffered through the war and are now gone, but also for those who have fought very hard um, to try to seek justice for our ancestors that died or lived through the war. Um, I also want to acknowledge particularly the efforts of um, people that have really um, told the stories. So one of the hardest parts about this is that these are not easy stories to tell. Um, and there are many survivors that, that died without ever sharing their story, without ever really telling their family what it was that they went through. Um, and so the War Claims Review Commission was really the first time that we had seen so many people come forward and tell their story. And so um, this document, the War Claims Review Commission's report, is actually available online. And all of the stories are, are recorded there. And then this really um, contributed as well to uh, the Guam War Survivor Memorial Foundation, which was really formed to tell the stories of our war survivors. Because the chairperson, uh, former Senator Frank Blas, had gone to DC and seen a memorial about the war and Guam was barely mentioned it was just a dot and it was just mentioned because of its involvement in you know the attack and then going and using Guam to bomb Japan there was no mention of our story at all and so the War Survivor Memorial Foundation has really worked to capture these stories which you'll see in the walls of the museum and then of course um, Senator Cecilia Bamba who's who really began this collection process. And so um, for the survivors here today, I really thank you um, for your, your, your strength and your endurance through all of this and your patience. And I really do hope that you see justice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the museum for the invitation to come and speak today. On a part of this, that I've really been wanting to talk about for a long time publicly. Um, I was not as fortunate as Governor, Adda, uh, Go Governor Calvo, who had parents who were and a grandparent willing to tell him about the war. Unfortunately, my mother, every time I went to see her, to talk to her about it, her only response would be, son, pray every night that you and your sisters never have to experience what we experienced during the war. And that would be the only response that I would get from her. When I was named to the commission and I took 4,000, helped transcribe nearly 4,000 testimonies here on Guam, traveled to Birmingham, uh, Burmington, Washington, California, in Sacramento, Los Angeles, and, Sa and San Diego, went to Las Vegas and Washington, D.C. To, to get uh, war survivors in the States to testify. I had over 4,000. On the way back, I came back to, to visit my mother who was living in California. I asked her mother, please, can you help me fill this out and tell me your story? She says, no. I said, mother, I'm a member of the commission. How can I possibly explain that my own mother refused to, to fill out this, this form to, to give her story? She goes, I told you already, pray every night that you and your sister never experience what we went through during the war. And having grown up with that as the only response from my mother, I was really excited when I came back because I was able to talk to a lot of the young activists, Loling Souter and some other people we were talking. And before Laura went off to her, uh, this was during the first administration of uh, Ricky Bedalio. And uh, we would talk and Ricky would talk, tell stories about the war. And on the side, I would tell Loling, you know, Loling, when you leave to do your doctorate, I really implore you, you've got to do a study 
to determine what was it that happened during the war that the women, to, especially to the women, and what did that do to them? Because it really, I, 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 at least from my experience with my mother and her sisters, um, never got any stories about what happened during the war. I mean, as a son, you'd hate to think about those kinds of things. Of, and I never really thought about what it could have been until Madeline named me to the, to the commission. And when I sat there and I listened to the stories, um, it was heart-wrenching. There were days that at the end of the day, uh, Speaker and Pinko, and, and we were over at the Chamorro Village, Speaker and Pinko and I would just sit there and look at each other and wish that we had a bottle of scotch <laughs> near, nearby. And with Rose and Arlene go, do you think we can file for PTSD for ourselves for having lived through these and heard these stories? I mean, it was, it was, there were times I would walk around the village with a grown man in his 60s or 70s and he would be bawling, just absolutely bawling. And people would be staring at us and trying to figure out what I did to the old man. <laughs> and you know, I, I had to take him out of the office because our, our office was barely the size of this corner here. And he wanted to talk privately. And he said, Judge, what was I supposed to do? And I'm going, Sign now, what? About what? And he goes, I was only seven. I was only seven. What was I supposed to do? And I'm going, About what, sir? And he goes, I saw them go into the house and I could hear my mother screaming. And I was told by the other soldiers if I went in I would be killed. And then to stand there and watch and see the soldier leave and find my mother bruised and, and beaten up in the house and in various state of undress. And I just thought, holy shit. How could a child have to bear that? I don't know. I see a lot of men in here. <laughs> and I know our relationships with our mothers. What would we do if we saw someone raping our mother? What would we do if we saw someone raping our mother and we were seven years old and couldn't take on five soldiers and had to watch? What would we do and how, what, what kind of burden, what kind of guilt do you carry for the rest of your life having experienced that? I had another gentleman who was always at the office and he, you know, just kind of was always helping out and, and was very jovial and he talked about the fact that uh, he had gone to Japan three times since the war and had made amends with um, the, the Japanese and, and had um, that, that there was reconciliation between them. And so Speaker and Pinker and I had determined he was going to be our first witness on December 8th when we had our first hearing here locally because he had told us that he wanted to, to tell us what he experienced in his family. And so he was number one on our list. The morning of the hearing, we looked around, he wasn't there. We called his house, no answer. 
So we went through the hearing, and so the next morning we were on the radio, and um, he called in. And uh, we said, well, what happened to you yesterday? He said, I didn't think that I could come down. And he says, but I can now tell you. And on the radio, on the air, he finally disclosed. He said, I and my seven siblings were made to stand and watch as our mother was raped. But all of us swore to each other that we would never talk about it. And he said, all of my siblings have now died. And my mother, may she rest in peace. But now I can offload this burden that I've been carrying all my life and tell you that I and my siblings were made to watch our mother being raped and never talking about it since the war. And this was 2003. It was almost 70 years later, 60 years later. And I thought, how? How could you have lived and carried that burden your entire life and that secret? What, how did that affect the way that they interacted? And then it caused me to stop and try to figure out how mother interacted. Um, you know, it was, she was fairly rigid and frigid. And, so, but I kept, I didn't want to think that something like that happened, but I saw pictures of my mother, who at the time when the war broke out was 24, and she was stunning. And I had other aunts who were about the same age who were equally stunning. And to hear that some of the, the others, the, the other aunts, talk about the fact that they put feces, or their, or, their, or their mother or their father put feces on the, the, the hem of their dresses or on their pants to make them smell like shit so that the, though they were beautiful and they, had, they, they were made to have um, soot on their face so they didn't look as beautiful as, as they really were so that they wouldn't be harmed. And the number of women that came in to testify about their rape. I remember distinctly this one time we were sitting there in this just spry, no, she wasn't even raped, come to think of it. She was just a spry, young, um, bouncy woman, just a few years older than I. And uh, she came in with her son, and she says, get out of here. And he goes, no, Mom, I'm, I'm staying here with you. And she goes, no, I'm. I can do this by myself. And uh, I knew the son, and I said, why don't you just excuse yourself and let your mother, you know, and I talk privately. And I said, um, why did you excuse him? She goes, he doesn't know that I am the product of a rape. And I looked at her and I go, what? And she goes, he doesn't know that I am the product of a rape. And I didn't want him to know about it, but I wanted to file my story. And the story of a woman who came in and talked about the fact that her brother was killed after a soldier stuck a hose up his rectum and turned on the hose. The, the stories were unbelievable. Most of them, you can find most of them in the, in the commission book. 
But ever since then, it's been my hope, and, and, and every chance I get when I, I have social work students come to see me in the office or, or um, kids going to do um, their masters in psychology or something, and I tell them, please, if you need a, to do a study while they're still alive, would you please do your master's thesis or your doctoral thesis, I mean dissertation, or even if you have to do a, um, an initial research paper on this issue, can you, because I'm trained to be a lawyer and a, and a political scientist, not a psychologist or a social worker, but you need to, somebody needs to do a study about what your generation endured and the effect that it had on you, what it did to your psyche, and as a result of what it did to you, what you did to my generation, which was the next one, and as a result of what happened to you and what you did to me, what I did to my children and their children. I said, somebody's got to do a study because when I was, I, I handled uh, family court for over 10 years. And uh, I kept saying there's a major, major dysfunction in this society. I mean, it, it, there can't be this high a percentage of dysfunctioning families just because. And I kept, hard, after I did all this, these interviews in the, in the War uh, Commission, I mean, it literally thousands. We filed 4,400 or something. But I read all of them. I helped transcribe maybe about less than 20% of them because Arlene and Rose did most of the other transcriptions. And, and Tony and I, in spite of the fact that we were the members of the commission, we, that we only, there was only the four of us, so we helped write out the stories and um, to listen to all these stories and try to figure out the impact, the sociological imp impact of not being able to, whether or not there was an effect of the women not being able to trust the men because they, or the men feeling inadequate because they hadn't protected their mothers or protected their sisters. I mean, the guilt, what kind of, I mean, just you really guys, think about it. The guilt that you would be, be carrying if you were, you were within this distance to watching your sister or your mother being raped and you couldn't do anything. Or, child, young, or interviewing some of the Manamco and they'd be telling me stories that, that they were five, 10 years old and being made to witness a beheading and being told if you cry if, you, if there's even an utterance that comes out of your mouth, you're going down the same way that that person just did. I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist or a social worker, but it just would seem to me that a child witnessing or experience the, these experiences that it had to have an unmistakably, I mean, huge impact on the way that they lived and the way that they handled themselves. And I've been wanting to get people to, to do a study. I, I keep trying to get, get somebody to do that. And I wanted more of the 
the, the Menomka that survived to talk about, honestly, about what, the, what happened to them. Because uh, there were literally dozens and dozens of grown men. And the interesting thing was, when I talked to the women that were raped, they were very stoic in their telling me about what happened. And it was interesting that the men who witnessed it were the ones that were crying. And I, I, I'm really trying to um, convey it to everybody that I think we as a community have got to encourage our younger people who are doing studies, if you know anybody that's in social work or in anthropology or anything, just there's, there's a treasure trove of information in, in Cecilia's papers, in Senator Bomba's papers, in, the, uh, in Mark for all of the reports that we did. And I know I wasn't supposed to talk about this, this new system. But I really apologize about the fact that you're having to, to relive the horrors and the atrocities of that experience by having to, to, to uh, type out or have somebody type out and relive that memory. When we were on the commission, we suggested in the legislation that, you know, there, there, there's no, there's, nobody had doctor's records from the 40s. I mean, you know, nobody had all of those records that you could have. It's on my um, computer that I could tell you everything that happened to me and it's documented. There, there, there were no documentation. And so what we had hoped was that it was going to be a system whereby all you had to do was say, bring your birth certificate and say that I was born in such and such a year, which made me five, 10, 12 years old during the period 1941 to 1944, end of sentence. And that birth certificate was supposed to be sufficient to get the minimal, you know, and, and if, some of them had some of the other stories about the rapes that they had. Um, and, and the interesting thing is some of the revelations that came out during the, during the testimony. I won't point out anyone in the room, but I remember the shock look on some people's face when one survivor got up and talked about the number of times that she was sexually assaulted. And her daughter was with her and just so many things were, it was the first time that some of them had opened up. And so it was, um, It was a, a very, very interesting time and made for some, gave me more information than I wanted to know <laughs> for having to ask mom so many times and not getting an answer. I got, I got more than, than, I, than I had uh, anticipated and it was worse than I thought. And uh, um, I, I really, really respect your generation I, I just cannot understand. I mean, I, I know, you know, as much as I love my mother, I, I would be a basket case if anything happened to her. And many of us are that protective of our mother that if, I mean, if anybody just so much as crossed their eyes at her, we'd take them down. And so, you just imagine that, uh, what our grandparents 
or not my grandparents, I'm so old, it'd be my parents. What my parents suffered, what some of you, your grandparents suffered, and those of you that actually went through it and actually witnessed it. Uh, I have the utmost respect um, for all that you suffered and uh, I'm hoping that at some point we can do the proper studies to be able to, no, it's not so much right size, as much as um, rehabilitate our community because I'm convinced that there's, there's something that's a dysfunction that needs to be addressed and can only be addressed if we get our, our parents to acknowledge or someone acknowledges and, and pinpoints that this, this behavior, um, this inability to be close or, or this, this, this relationship that had to be real distant or whatever, that, that many of our parents and our grandparents had with us because of their experiences during the war, the impact that it had on us, consequently, what impact that had on our child rearing and our, our interaction with our, our children and as a consequence theirs. Until we do that, we're gonna continue this cycle of the uh, abuse that uh, they suffered and the atrocities they suffered during the war not being addressed. And we'll continue to, to pass it on to future generations until somebody s stops and says, this has to be addressed, otherwise you'll carry this forward. I could go on more, but I, I, I won't. I just, I just thought I would, uh, Nicole asked me to come and give me, give some of my impressions of the interviews, uh, sometime when we have, you have time and you want, call me and we'll sit down and talk. And some, but but it, just, it, just, it just broke my heart to walk around with so many grown men who just kept saying, Judge, what was I supposed to do? And that story, that man that was supposed to be our first speaker, and he, on the radio he told us that uh, what had happened the next week he passed away. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, we'd like to open up the, uh, the Q&A and uh, uh, discussion portion so we can call our speakers up. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge real quick, thank you again, Governor Calvin, for coming. Thank you for coming. Uh, and I'd like to call, uh, Department of Wall, President Thomas Blondin, for being here. Uh, <laughs> I don't care. Um, we would also like to ask for those of you with a question or a comment to please wait until you receive the microphone to speak. Thank you. We've also we've opened up the exhibit, so if anybody would like to visit the exhibition, it's open now. And we have refreshments in the museum too, in the Banana and in over, so please help yourself. But if there are any questions or, or uh, comments that anybody would like to share? Is that okay? Thanks for sharing. I just wanted to ask about the uh, testimony that Sean Mama gathered will those be anyway you would take those and turn those into uh, current claims? Well, um, I know that the current claims, it's, if they're stories of people that have died, um, their survivors or their descendants wouldn't be able to make claims on those stories. So um, if, say, maybe a descendant that qualifies for someone who did die, so if they're either a spouse or a parent or a child of someone who did die and their story is documented and they don't know the story of that death, then they could use that. Because in the form you have to describe, you, they, the form actually asks for the place of death, the estimated time of death, and a description of the death. So maybe if a descendant really doesn't know, they could use that. 
Um, another interesting thing, I there was so much, in, I have like 12 pages of what I was going to read to you, but there's so much on this. Um, but one thing I had left out that I did want to talk about this evening was that there is, um, in the same legislation, there's $5 million that is authorized to the Department of Interior for grants to people who want to um, do research, who want to write about, who want to have events or do documentaries or books about the war experience. However, um, in talking with Dr. Underwood about what that meant, if you read further, right underneath, I have the, the legislation here too, a copy of the legislation. Right underneath it says that the sections dealing with the war claims um, are funded by Section 30, but the section dealing with the grant does not have the Section 30 as a funding source, and no funding source is identified. So while Department of Interior is authorized to give grants up to $5 million, or a total of $5 million, I'm sure, for smaller grants, but there's no funding source, so there would have to be another endeavor to identify a funding source for that. But it'd be a great project to take. So all of um, Senator Bamba's notes and um, collection of stories are at the MARC, at the Micronesian Area Research Center. So if any of you are interested in reading through her notes or reading through these stories as uh, Speaker Cruz encouraged, they're, they're there. So for people doing research, please you know, use this because she really collected a lot and a, most of the people she interviewed have since died. So just want to ask for anything. Um, I just have a question with regards to like the prereqs. So is that under the Department of Interior? Do they decide on that? And with regards to the prereqs regarding you know, the Section 30 and everything, descendants and like that. Also, oh, in terms of who determines if you are eligible for the claim. So it's the Foreign Claims Review Commission. So um, the way the process works is you would fill out the claim and then you'd have to mail it in because they need the official notarization of it. And then they have 30 days to make a decision on your claim. And then once they notify you of it, you have 30 days to contest it. Um, you can also have an attorney represent you um, and the attorney can contest the claim. Um, but it's all left to the Foreign Claims Review Commission to decide, basically. Also, you can't file claims. So say you experienced uh, rape and also forced, forced march. You can only file a claim for one or the other. You can't file claims for both. And would it be then um, possible to do the figure as a lawyer about a class action suit? Because we up we're already on this, like, how many years now? And a good portion of them already passed on, you know, so now it's just really handled. I feel like it's kind of almost a slap in the face with regards to, you know, any reparation because most of them, I know my grandmother just passed away a long time ago already, 2008, so it, it kind of hurts because it's been that long, it's taken this long. And yeah. the prereqs are, you know, we have to follow these prereqs really, really. I don't know if it's possible to even do like a, some sort of class action lawsuit with this. I know there was an attempt by, by an attorney in Washington, D.C., and if you speak to me afterwards, I can point you out to someone who can maybe get you in contact with them to whether or not it's still possible. I, I have to say that when we were on the commission, Everybody has to understand it's, it's an issue of tort law. <coughs> tort is when someone does something, injures another person, and you, get, 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 you, you sue for it, okay? And in tort law, tort law never recognized an award to the descendant of the person that was actually injured. Unless you actually died from the injury, you can sue as the descendant of the injured person. But if you were injured and you didn't die from the injury, but uh, you weren't, you didn't file your claim in time, or you didn't sue, your children can't can't um, can't sue for you um, on the 
on a uh, for just the, for the injury if that wasn't the cause of the death and so we we went through a lot of arguing about the fact that the initial the initial recommendation of the commission was there were four of us attorneys on the commission and senator and speaker and pinko and all of us first insisted that we'd have to follow the law and all of the experts who came to talk to us said you have to follow the law that the only ones who get compensa compensated are the descendants of the ones that were kill killed during the war, died actually during the war. The survivors of the war who are alive at the time the legislation passed. And during one of our second to the last meeting, Speaker and Pinko made an impassioned, impassioned speech. I mean, all five of us were in tears. Um, that it was just wrong to not include everybody back to 1944. So as a compromise so that we could have a unanimous decision on the commission, we made a legal fiction and uh, or we contrived legal fiction and said we would recognize as eligible anyone that was alive in 1991, when, sen when uh, Delegate uh, Congressman Ben Bloss almost got his legislation through. And it really was. It, it, it was like at the edge of this ledge, and the legislature kicked them back and said, no, we want more money. And Danny knew you said, I'm sorry, guys. I carried this for you all the way to this, and it's, that was it. So, it, and so when Madeline tried to do it, to, to, to at least to the 91 deadline, she was beaten back on that, and McCain said we would give you the ones that are alive today in, I think it was 2010, 2010. And she said no, um, because, because everybody on island was insisting you had to include the descendants. When we first came out with our commission report, the first one out of the, 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 the gate in opposition to our recommendations 1991 was the Guam legislature. Passed a resolution saying no, it should be back to 1944. And we kept saying it, you cannot take it to 1944. It's only going to be from the date that the bill passed, prospectively. And unfortunately, it kept getting pushed forward and forward. If it had passed in 2004, in, in, in four, when we first finished our, our report, your mother and my mother would have gotten a, an award, but it wasn't. They've both since passed, and now the only, the, the only ones that are going to be able to receive any compensation as survivors are individuals who were alive after December 16th, uh, December 23rd, 2016. And a class action lawsuit for anybody before that um, would be near futile. I mean, I hate saying that, but we have to just be real. And as Victoria put it, the reason why the United States was so insistent that the commission recognize legal precedent of providing a tort award only to the injured person who was alive is that they didn't want to break open the door with the slaves because that would be trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars for all the injuries that were suffered by them and you know and so we weren't um, and so so that legal precedent survives to today and I don't care how many resolutions I get passed or the legislature passes it's not going to be able to change that the recognized law, tort law is survivors alive at the date of the 
because they were the ones that actually suffered. It wasn't we that, that suffered. It was our mothers that suffered that should be getting the award. So there's, there is a section under forced march that it says either forced march or hiding from, forced march to internment or hiding from internment. So I believe, and you were saying your family had been hiding in a cave to avoid internment. So that would qualify under that section because you were alive and you were hiding or you were hidden by your family. So I believe that you would. Yes, yeah. I was born on on, uh, in a cave. Yes, let me, let me read the exact language. And I don't know whether this uh, cave is noted as historical or what, but yeah. um, it's been mentioned um, on the radio about the name of it is Pajestis, Vijan Pajestis in Malolu. So uh, that is where I was born. And I know that my mom really suffered um, mm -hmm. carrying me. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just that I, I, in the beginning, like everyone was saying, is that uh, you can make a claim, you know, you can file before, but she died about, about over 10 years ago. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so it says yeah. it's uh, 10,000 for forced march internment or hiding to evade internment. And so you could fill out a claim <coughs> and just explain. Uh, where your family was and the circumstances of that. Um, yeah. Okay, I just, I just, you know, there's no, I don't really know about the war, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm alive, I was mm -hmm. born, and I have the birth certificate that, yeah. that I was born. That, so I think that would be sufficient. Okay. okay, thank you very much. <laughs> At least it's uh, to my satisfaction that, mm -hmm. you know, I'm eligible. There was a young 74-year-old um, lady I met today, and um, she was born on June 29, 1944, I believe. The liberation was July 21st. And she says, Do I, can I make a claim? I mean, I was born, it says there that whoever was alive before the war ended, would they qualify? She was just a baby being carried nine months, I guess, with the mom during the bombardment and all that. Yeah. Under the section that, that um, Victoria read, a, a case could be made that, that they did suffer. I mean, she may not have remembered it, but I'm sure those nine days in the cave were not like nine days into, in a crib in an air-conditioned house today. Mm -hmm. She suffered something, something she may not have remembered, but she did. She, and she wasn't fed normally, uh, you know, unless she was fortunate enough to be, that, that her, her, she was breastfed, but otherwise there were, there were inconveniences and suffering that, that she and her mother experienced. She can't claim her mother's, but she can claim hers and have the Foreign Settlement Claims Commission address that, and according to the legislation, that could be up to $10,000 in, in an award. Not that I'm encouraging money parts, but just the, the fact that um, she can. Thank you. And yes, I think that was, that was so important for a lot of those who were born before the end of the war. And remember, it's, it, that's the invasion, I mean, not the invasion period, but that was the, the time we had liberated and a lot of bombings all over the island. So I think it would be well uh, noted if, if for those who were born 
two weeks, even four weeks before the war. And uh, this lady was talking about being born in a cave. What if the situation turns to be that the woman was pregnant at the time that the Mars was going on? Then after Guam was liberated, which is what, back in 1944? She gave birth. Would that individual be entitled for the claim? I, I can I'm not qualified to answer that. I mean, I, I know that at this point, it would, it doesn't hurt to submit a claim and explain that. You would just explain those circumstances um, and submit the claim. And I think that's part of this, this process has been so dragged on for 75 years and then to kind of be at this moment where to actually file a claim and receive a claim, you still have to kind of prove your situation to this Foreign Claims Review Commission in Washington, D.C., and it ultimately is up to them. And for me, I would say yes, but it's not up to me, right? And, and I, I also think it's important to note that what we experience and what we know, right, of, of being in the womb or being a mother that carries a child and imagining, as Speaker Cruz was saying, what that must have been like, I would say absolutely, but we're, we're being subjected to basically asking someone else to make that decision for us. And, and our local government essentially through the use of Section 30 funds is paying them to make that decision for us. And so it's the situation that we're in. And so I'm not qualified to answer that, but I would encourage that that person still file a claim. I think that anybody who was alive in the war experienced a suffering and should file a claim. And, and I know that there are people that are very eager and interested in helping do that. Um, I would be happy to if people needed help writing out their story. I know um, Senator Frank Blas Jr. has offered his office in Barragata, like I said, Vice Speaker Terlahi, the Congresswoman's office. And so maybe as a community, really what needs to happen at this point is we just get these claims written and filed and then wait, you know, unfortunately for the decision to come back. I think that gentleman up there. Uh. In regards to the claims and who designates the proper time span or whatever as to what we're receiving, I argue that at times when I think about it. My name is Bill Sablon and I was born on August 28, 1944, almost approximately one month after the Marines landed on Guam. And they were still on the beachhead. And my mother was telling me that it was wrong timing for her to get pregnant at that time period because everything was in chaos. Japanese were running all over the place, stabbing, shooting, and killing people for their survival. And our Marines and Army soldiers and sailors were still on the beaches. My mother said it was so hard for her to even have milk to feed me or whatever. They had to go grind coconut milk just to water it down a little bit so there'll be enough for me to eat. Um, I didn't realize that was such a pain for my mom for her being pregnant. But the thing is, who designates mm. when one was liberated? Because I was a soldier before. And I fought in Vietnam. And the thing is, nobody is liberated or nobody is free and nobody is secured until after the last enemy troop is secured. Be either he gets shot, killed, or whatever, or surrenders. But this was 44. Mm -hmm. My interpretation of what was going on is 
For the survivors that came on would be any time from 1945 and earlier since the beginning up until we, I'm saying like myself, was able to, uh, how would you say it, walk and move around freely. Mm -hmm. Because as far as I'm concerned, the Japanese straggler that they found in 1972, Guam wasn't really secured yet until the last enemy troop was captured and surrendered in. And uh, a lot of the stories I heard was that there were still a lot of killings going on after 1944, up to 45, 46, 47. Japanese strikers that didn't surrender because they thought the war was still going on. They were still killing people from Guam. Mm -hmm. And not just Guam, Northern Guyana also. But the thing is, uh, Japanese strikers were raiding people's ranches, stealing their food, killing some of the farmers, and uh, taking their chickens and whatever they could find to eat. And like you know, your boy, he lived underground, mm -hmm. and nobody knew he was around, and people were just walking right past him every day. Mm -hmm. So my question is: is when is this date finalized, and uh, when was Guam actually liberated? Because you know we would celebrate July twenty-first as Guam's liberation. The Marines were just still sitting on the beach. They were just hitting the beachheads. They were here. Who was to know that they would win the war? You know? So, so I, the I, thing I, is, there's a lot of questions to be asked before this thing was even, should have been even put out to the public. And the timelines. Uh, a lot of us right now that are a little bit younger, we were born around that time period, from 1944 up until the war actually ended in 45, 46. But even then, it was still, the war was still going on. And the United States, they were so quick to forgive Japan, not to give compensation or anything from them, you know. Uh, all the time, this always happens. And the people that suffer in the Philippines, those people suffered too. And some of the people in Alaska, you know, Guam was the only place that were in the United States. Continental, continental United States was never hit, except for Guam and Hawaii. And a little bit of uh, the very straight area in Alaska. So let's not forget that. Uh, I don't believe we were liberated August, I mean July 21st, 1944. I'll tell you that. Because we were still fighting. We and the soldiers were all still fighting. And I thank God for me surviving it. But my mother said she was in pain. She was in her eighth month having me when this thing was going on. And on August 28th, I was born. But the thing was, it was hard for the mothers and the families to get food for their children along, aside from them, just for themselves too. So my question is, who makes these daylines? Because there's a lot of unanswered questions. So um, I'm looking at the instructions from the Foreign Claims Review Commission, and this could be open for interpretation, but it says the claimant suffered as a result of the attack and occupation of Guam by Imperial Japanese military forces during World War II or incident to the liberation of Guam by United States military forces, any of the following. And then it lists the rape or severe personal injury, forced labor or personal injury not amounting to severe personal injury, forced march internment or hiding to evade internment. And so it says to the liberation of Guam. And so there isn't an actual date of July 21st. And there are people, like I, I remember interviewing Sun Jack Luhan about how his family had been hiding in a, in a hole underground in Mokfuk and they weren't discovered until a month after July 21st. By the time they had gotten to Gatnya, everybody had been 
sort of living in these camps already for a while, and so they had been there long after, you know, after July 21st. So there isn't a date, and so what I would say is that you can make a case in your explanation in the claim for what your mother went through, for what ultimately you did experience in the womb, which a lot of research can back that children in the womb, um, everything that's happening in their surroundings affects them, and it affects them through the rest of their lives. So I would file a claim if I were you. Um, but again, it's, it's up to the Foreign Claims Review Commission. So. I mean, you see, during, during combat time, okay, the Marines landed there on the beach. July, July 21st, they say we were liberated. That was the day they landed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you fight, it's what we call, for us guys that are used to being in the military or been in combat, uh, when you're having a firefight that much with so many people on the coast and the battleships right outside, and more troops are still being transported in, that isn't done in one day. They landed July 21st, how can they say we were liberated? They didn't even know if they were gonna win the war. Yeah, they outnumbered the Japanese, but you gotta understand the Japanese were here for like almost, in the Marianas for like almost 20 years after World War I when they took over the Northern Marianas. The U.S. didn't even want nothing to do with Northern Marianas. They just wanted Guam for their stopping off point for fueling. Now, since those time periods, the whole Marianas is starting to look good to the U.S. as far as to their advantage. So now they're offering us a lot of things to come and get. And all these promises. We're getting promises like the American Indians. They're the first American citizens. But they're in reservations right now. You know, they can't do anything unless they secure with the Indian, Indian border, whatever you want to call it. So anyway, well, my question is, uh, I don't think they should have cut it off right there at July 21st. Yeah, there, there's no date. So again, I would just file the claim. Well, see no, what date, happens. no date, but even for us to celebrate July 21st as Liberation Day, you know, that was wishful thinking for most people. But we weren't really liberated that day. We were liberated almost two or three years later. Because mm -hmm. fighting was still going on. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm sorry. I don't get yeah, carried away okay. there. Mm -hmm. I'm sensitive with something like this. Thank you. And I am by no means a spokesperson for the Foreign Claims Review Commission or understand their processes. Um, and in fact, I, I personally just feel that this whole process is, is in, an, in a way demoralizing and it's, it's important, it's, it's, a, it's something that should have happened decades ago, um, but it's not an easy process and I don't personally have the answers, but I do encourage again our survivors who are alive to you know, go through the process if that is what they're able to do um, and, and see what happens. <coughs> Hi, thank you for taking the time. I have a legal question. The Japanese were the aggressor. The Americans forgave the Japanese. We're stuck in the middle. Can we turn around and sue the Japanese? <laughs> I'm not practicing anymore. <laughs> I, I would assume that according to the treaty, we cannot, um, because the U.S. assumed responsibility for those claims. Yeah, that, I mean, that's what's been expressed in the legislation and, and the reason given for going to the United States. And ultimately, Guam was brought into this conflict not because of us, but because the United States was here. And so that's another thing that we have to remember is that our people didn't bring this conflict upon us, but we suffered tremendously because of it. And it's, it's a rather unfortunate situation that we have to continue to prove our case even now because it's very obvious the suffering that occurred. 
Um, but as I explained, for decades, nobody was telling this story in Congress, and it was just not even in their thinking. And you know, another thing that Dr. Underwood had shared with me about uh, the way these things work is that, you know, as, as in business, Congress operates where you don't get what you deserve, you get what you negotiated. And unfortunately, this is what we were able to negotiate. It's not what we deserve. It's long. It's far too late for many, many, many people. Um, but it's what was negotiated. And so it opens a whole <laughs> other discussion, but it's something to think about. Anyone else with a question? Thank you, Michelle. This is really informative. Um, out of curiosity, what has like Saipan have they gone through the same process of reparations as well? Uh, the Saipanese were actually um, at that time nationals of Japan, so they were not U.S. nationals. So Japan. Um, you know, Guam in 1898, the United States uh, occupied Guam and the rest of the Marianas went to Germany and then to Japan. And so at the time of the war, um, they were not considered U.S. nationals, so they could file claims to the Japanese government. Though the U.S. did extend claims to Micronesia in 1972 that included the rest of the Marianas. And so they were compensated through that. Uh, but Guam was not included for the same reason um, that I mentioned at the beginning. That they had thought that Guam had been taken care of, so to speak, in 1945 with the Guam Meritorious Claims Act. Okay. Did you want to talk about Saipan? No. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Uh, this is, I was born in 1943, July 31st. Makes me 74 years old right now. When my mom, uh, my father was beheaded by the Japanese, him and two other men. They made them dig their graves, held their, tied their hands behind their backs, and then they beheaded them and keep them into the hold. Can I claim for my father? My, my mom is not alive, she passed away. Yeah. First, I'm really sorry about that and that experience, but yes, you may. Um, and if you have other siblings, it would be split amongst your siblings. Okay, and then I can claim for myself as well, since I was born in yes. 1943. Yes. I remember my sister was telling me that when the Japanese were bombing Guam, that they happened to, I was on a hammock, I was just a baby. Everybody ran to hide and to be safe and they forgot all about me. Mm. And I just want to know what claim can I have on that? It does have an impact on the way I grew up, psychological impact to know that this happened to me. The way that the, um, the forms are, you're going to have, you're going to, have to detail that, that story in, in, in your application. I just wanted to share, uh, this is a difficult subject to talk about, on um, post-war Japanese war, um, Anthony Mignon Kena, uh, Cruz Kena, speaker, uncle, um, thank you so much, and, and uh, Silvana, Prairie Silvana Mignon on my mom's side. And uh, I was two years old, I left Guam, was raised in the United States, grew up in Newport, Rhode Island, joined the Air Force at 17, and uh, I know the atrocities of war. Oh my God, you know? I saw a little boy over here, and uh, as a former military Air Force officer, I want to salute all of you 
uh, makes me want to cry, man, because uh, when I was stationed under 1987, uh, my auntie, uh, <clears throat> auntie told me, she said, Anthony, do you know why your dad is the way he is? My dad was uh, army, he was in the Korean War, and uh, we actually came back to came back to Guam in 1967. He went to Vietnam. Uh, for two years, we stayed in Petey. There's a little hill up there. I remember me and a bunch of little other Chamorro guys, you know, climbing that hill. My brother and I actually found this box. It had seven millimeter <coughs> shells and grenades in it. We didn't know what the heck that was, man. We brought it home, stuck it underneath the bed. Next thing we know, EOD's out there, evacuating everybody, took the explosives away. But when I came back to Guam in 1987, and my auntie said to me, Anthony, do you know why your dad's the way he is? Uh, I just thought because he was king, you know. It wasn't that, because, you know, Speaker B.J. Cruz, man, um, I didn't hear about the race, but my auntie told me that, you know, they were trying to evade the Japanese and uh, the family. And uh, we're talking little kids, man, and, and the little children should never have to go through the atrocities of war, but it happens. It's happening today. And uh, my auntie told me that my grandma, uh, as they were trying to escape, she scraped her leg and it caught gangrene, and so it was difficult for her to escape. The Japanese caught up with that family, my dad, his brothers, my uncles, my auntie, and um, to teach them a lesson, they went to behead my grandmother. And um, my auntie told me that the uh, machete, because a Japanese had used a machete to whack through the jungle, that the blades weren't sharp, so they had to hack and hack on my grandmother until her head fell off. I just, when she told me that story, man, I just couldn't even stand that. My dad was probably only about six or seven years old at that time, man. It's horrible, you know? And, uh, you know, sir, you brought up a very good point. Uh, war did not end on the 21st. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. You need to follow up on that. And uh, I will have to follow up on that because that is, I never thought about that, you know? War continued. I, I just want to say, <clears throat> Speaker, that when I was attending the university in Arkansas and Louisiana, um, two different professors, two different times, shared with the class that if we wanted to know history, is to talk to them and uncle, talk to them, talk to the people that were in the war, because they were the ones that knew war. And uh, um, you know what saddens me? to come here and listen to this because uh, uh, I, I have no uh, motives with the money thing here. I just wanted to hear the story. I just didn't know, sir, that it was that deep rooted, you know, because uh, after hearing my auntie, I thought, how could it ever be even worse than that? I'm sure it was, you know, and uh, that's why I never went to Menengo uh, because that's where my grandmother was beheaded. But on the lighter note, there was still even a better uh, time that my, when I was here in 1987, I went fishing with my, grand, my grandfather on the Salam and Gan side. And, and we were down at the, at the beach, and so I brought up the topic about war. I said, hey, Grandpa, <clears throat> what happened during the war? And uh, he said, what's uh, that one? So I knew not, not to touch it. So we were fishing. I said, hey, Grandpa, what's the biggest fish you ever caught? He said, during the war, this big black whale came into the shore. I said, big black whale? He said, yeah. And when it, it came right on the shore, and I, I ran. Then I came back because it didn't move. You know what that was? That was a torpedo. And it did not explode. <laughs> Grandpa went up and he said he touched it. And he said he knew that it wasn't a fish, you know. And uh, I just can't imagine, you know, uh, working on the wall 
we really need to appreciate what we have today and uh, really need to uh, keep uh, the, the memories still alive for our younger generations. So we said that we need to do that so that they never forget what happened. Um, cruelty, man, you know, with, uh, I'm going to start taking time, but cruelty with uh, soldiers in war is unbeknownst to me. I'm a military officer, former officer. I cannot picture myself doing that to a captain. I just can't see me doing that. And uh, I just want to thank you guys. Thank you. I, I wanted to say one thing that you triggered for me. So war didn't end on July 21st, and largely because of Guam's involvement of the war, it really made Guam a place that is always at war. We always feel that we are at war. Our family members are fighting and all have fought in every war since then in such high numbers. And, and even the funding source for the reparations is only, the other thing is that reparations won't be paid immediately. We have to earn more money than we earned in 2014 in Section 30 funds. And then that excess funds will be put into the war claims account. So only until we welcome enough military to garner enough Section 30 funds to exceed that amount will we be able to have money to pay our war claims. And so just in the same way as you know, Speaker Cruz mentioned, every war survivor I've interviewed has always said, I don't ever want you or my children or my grandchildren to experience the suffering that I experienced. And, but yet Guam is, is always, the target of war and you know you've got bombs named Guam killers today and it it is not a thing of the past and how do we feel about that today and why must we continue to welcome military to pay for the sufferings of our elders it it's difficult for me as a young person to really understand okay. <laughs> Just ironic, shall I say. I just wanted to thank everybody who wanted to come out tonight. I mean, it's been raining, and I know there's other things happening, but I really do appreciate the fact that you're willing to come out and, and listen to us. And um, I hope I didn't upset too many people. <laughs> thank you all.